Hello YouTube, Dave here again. The Call of Cthulhu role-playing game is one of my favorite RPGs. I don't get a chance to run it all that often, but every time I have, I've had a lot of fun with it. Uh, you know, Chaosium puts out some really amazing stuff, but the Chaosium system was not my introduction to the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game. In fact, 3rd edition D&D was my introduction to the uh, Call of Cthulhu role-playing game. Not directly with the D&D rulebooks, but with the D20 version of the Call of Cthulhu. So I'm just going to talk about this a little bit. It's kind of an unusual uh, system, I guess, to say the least. You know, the question is, is this a situation where chocolate meets peanut butter, or is it kind of a mishmash? Of, uh, of systems that doesn't quite work as well as maybe you would hope. Uh, I'll sort of address that sort of towards the end of the video. I'm not going to do a full comprehensive flip through, but I do want to talk a little bit about just the things that were unique to this version of the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game. Uh, this version was actually made uh, in collaboration between Wizards of the Coast and Chaosium. Uh, Chaosium would actually uh, lend some of their systems, like their sanity system, directly into this version of the game, and Chaosium would also support the D20 version of the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game with the official Nocturnum campaign, uh, which was like, I think, a, an almost 20-level campaign for Call of Cthulhu, as well as some regional source books that were statted for both the D20 system and the Chaosium. So I think it was 6th edition at the time, Call of Cthulhu RPG. Uh, so first of all, we just have a really cool, I love the covers from these, you know, sort of early 2000 era Wizards of the Coast books. They would actually make a physical product, a physical model that they would photograph and use that for the cover. So you have like the menacing looking eyes there with like the, the you know, looking beyond the veil uh, so you got like the star field sort of in the eyes and like the, the teeth there, the tentacles sort of bursting out through. Really cool presentation. Like I said, I'm not going to flip through everything here. I just want to give you an idea of sort of how this book is structured and some of the, you know, I guess, the idi idiosyncrasies, I guess we can say, of the uh, Call of Cthulhu D20 system. One of the strange things about this is just the way that they divide the book up. So instead of just being like your traditional like straight vertical uh, columns, you actually have these like diagonal separations on some of the pages and you know it's not all of them which is again really weird like this first section is more or less like normal like you would expect from an RPG but like a role-playing game book but then you've got like these other sections that have sort of this like diagonal separation of your columns it's uh, you know visually interesting and on the pages where they actually do it on both sides it actually looks kind of good because it has like the sort of almost like pyramid kind of look to it but it is uh, an interesting design choice, we'll say. Now, I mentioned with the Nocturnum thing that it was like a 20-level campaign, and that's because the D20 system uses the D20 rule set. It's basically 3rd edition D&D just reworked for the Call of Cthulhu uh, style. And you actually do have character levels. So you can progress from 1st to 20th level in this game, and you do that by earning experience points. Uh, which you earn by resolving conflicts or overcoming challenges. They could be like role-playing elements. They could be, um, you know, more like story rewards for the experience points. But like D20 D&D, like modern D, like D&D in general, uh, one of the ways that you gain experience points is through combat and actually fighting, you know, the mythos creatures or the dangerous cultists uh, and doing them a bit more frequently in this system than you would in the Chaosium version. Uh, you have two different ways of creating your character. You can either make your character based off of a defensive build or off of an offensive build. The defensive build gives you a good saving throw progression in two of the saving throws as opposed to uh, is just one, which is what you get with the offensive version. And you actually get to choose which saving throw uh, has that, you know, like the good bonus. So, for example, it's still fortitude, reflex, and will. Like it uses the D20 system, you know, pretty precisely. Um, but instead of it being set with the, the defensive option giving you, like, say, a good fortitude and will, or a good reflex and will, you get to choose where you put those good progressions. So if you wanted a good reflex and a good will saving throws, then you could do that. If you wanted a good fortitude and a good will saving throws, you could do that uh, with the defensive build. 
The downside of the defensive build is that you don't gain very much in terms of your base attack bonus. Your base attack starts at zero and it goes up by one for every, uh, every even level thereafter. So second, uh, fourth, sixth, all the way up to 20th level where you get a base attack of plus five or plus 10 and a secondary attack at plus five because it's the D20 system. Uh, this is effectively the wizards uh, or sorcerers base attack progression from D&D third edition. If you take the offensive build, you only get one good saving throw progression, but you get to choose which of the three that is. And you also get a better base attack progression, uh, similar to, again, the D&D equivalent would be the rogue, the monk, the cleric, the druid. Uh, so you get, uh, your base attack bonus goes up by two for every three levels, uh, starting at plus one and going up to uh, plus 15. Now, I don't, I can't recall if in, the, in third edition D&D, if the cleric uh, or the pre characters that got the, uh, the plus 15 max uh, base attack progression, I can't remember if they actually started with plus one at first level or not, but I know that they do here simply because uh, it is, um, you know, the offensive build. So they want to give you the, you know, the benefit is the better base attack progression. So you have to start with at least a plus one there. Uh, you also get feats and ability score increases, similar to uh, the D20 system for D&D. And your skills now, uh, your skills and your hit dice are the same, regardless of whether you take offensive or defensive. So for your hit dice, you're always getting D8s at every level. And for your skills, you start with eight skills that you're proficient in. Um, or not proficient in, sorry. You get eight, uh, you get eight skills, or sorry, you get 12 skills. Uh, that you can choose as your core skills, and then you get eight skill points plus your intelligence modifier every level. At first level, it's multiplied by four, which is standard for third edition D&D, but you actually get to choose what your core skills, which ones you want to be your class skills, where one skill point equals one rank, with each rank giving you a plus one bonus on your skill checks. Uh, you do have templates that you can choose from if you want uh, to use like the, uh, the suggestions here. For example, a soldier, their skill list would be climb, hide, jump, listen, move silently, spot, swim, use rope, wilderness lore, and you always get to choose three additional ones. So you get, a, you get I think, was that nine? Uh, and then you get to choose three more, and then you get your, your skill points that you can sort of spend on increasing them. And again, it works like third edition D&D. So your maximum ranks is always equal to your level plus three. And uh, for, the, for your core skills, the ones that you chose for your, your build, and any other skill that you decide to put points into, you get uh, one, uh, you get, it's two points for every rank, and the number of maximum ranks you can have is half of whatever uh, you could have in your core skills. So at first level, you can have four ranks in your core skills and only two ranks in your non-core skills. And um, that's, but they both cost the same points. So it's it's never really worth, uh, and this is one of the issues with like third edition D&D, is that it's just never honestly worth putting skills into a cross-class or non-class skill because it costs twice as much to get half the bonus. So it's just, yeah, bad overall. But with Call of Cthulhu, like I said, it is sort of offset by the fact that you get to choose. You don't have to use the templates. They're just sort of there for you to make things a little bit easier. So uh, cool stuff there. There was also a variant rule you could use for defense bonuses. Uh, which would actually give you just automatic bonuses to your armor class or your defense, uh, which you didn't get normally. Um, so if you took the defensive character uh, build and you use this uh, defense bonus variant rule, at first level you get a plus two bonus to your AC, and that goes up to plus six by the time you reach 20th level. If you took the offensive option, you start with plus zero, and you only get up to plus four total. So um, the defensive one, again, works really well for, it, it works best with this, uh, this variant rule in use. Uh, and then you just get your, like, your regular skill descriptions like we had before in D&D, so I'm not going to go through all of those. Uh, you do get uh, feats as well. So again, a lot of the feats are similar to D&D, things like toughness giving you extra hit points, weapon focus, uh, you know, giving you an extra bonus to hit, improve critical, improved initiative. You know, a lot of it is kind of the same, but there are a few that work more with the with the uh, the Call of Cthulhu uh, sort of system. Uh, I'm hoping I can find one off the bat here, like drive-by attack, um, if you're operating a vehicle. 
Um, yeah, there's a, there's a few. I think there was uh, skill emphasis. Uh, wealth is a feat that you can have here, which increases your starting, your uh, your starting income, I guess. Uh, you gain additional amount of money equal to your starting savings uh, as a windfall. Oh, okay, so you can actually take that at any time. You can gain this feat multiple times. It's fairly, okay, so you can take the wealth feat to just become rich, which is kind of cool. Um, you also get some psychic feats, which are sort of new to this one as well. Uh, and I'm not going to get too much into those here. Your sanity system is taken straight from the the, uh, the Chaosium Call of Cthulhu. Uh, you have your sanity score, your starting sanity, is equal to five times your wisdom score. So if you had a 10 wisdom, for example, your maximum sanity would be 50 points. You can get up to a maximum of uh, 99, so that's the absolute highest number of sanity points you can ever have. And your starting sanity is five times whatever your wisdom score is. As you go through the game and you're forced to make uh, sanity checks, uh, then what you do is you roll a percentile die. And if you get your sanity, your current sanity score or lower, then you succeed. If you get above that number, however, you fail, and then you will usually lose points off your sanity, depending on what it was that you were sort of um, forced to make the rollover. So if you're encountering a mythos creature or coming across the scene of like a grisly murder or something like that, it may end up impacting your sanity. Uh, it does have the getting used to the awfulness uh, rule as well. So for example, if a creature can cause you to lose 1d6 sanity, um, multiple encounters with that creature can never take more than six points total from you. So after you lose six points of sanity, like come, you know, coming across like animated skeletons, for example, encountering a skeleton later on just isn't going to bother you because you've seen them enough before to kind of get used to it. Um, which maybe not a good thing, but it is the way that the system works there. And uh, yeah, you can get um, you can get insanities. You can develop phobias, which is always you know one of my favorite things. I love the uh, the phobia uh, sidebar here with the different uh, phobias and what they are, like the zoophobia, fear of animals, demophobia, fear of crowds. Which I wouldn't say I have a phobia of that, but I am very uncomfortable in crowds. So I might have a little bit of that. But yeah, there's really cool stuff in there. And then the combat system is essentially just D&D, uh, third edition. You've got bull rush, you have grapple checks, you have attacks of opportunity, unfortunately. Uh, which, oh, <laughs> speak of the devil, they're, they're right there. You also have your equipment section. It is different to see, like, modern-day firearms uh, in a Wizards of the Coast role-playing book, but here we are. Uh, and yeah, and the, the, the weapons tables will usually tell you what country of origin the weapon is from and what year it first uh, was introduced. So you can use that to help you with uh, what's appropriate for the 1920s era or what's appropriate for the modern era, which was uh, the year 2000 as far as this product is concerned. Uh, but everything else like is pretty standard until we get to spells. Now, spells don't work the way that they do in 3rd edition D&D, where you just have spell slots, you memorize spells, you can cast them. In Call of Cthulhu, spells are not to be taken lightly. You don't have spell slots in the D20 Call of Cthulhu, so instead, each spell has a cost. Uh, and the cost is usually a combination of ability score damage or just outright drain. Ability score damage can be recovered or healed over time. Uh, but if you're if you suffer ability score drain, that's permanent and it's just gone. And we'll see that some of these spells have some pretty nasty costs. So, for example, to become a spectral hunter, it actually costs you two Constitution drain, which is permanent, and three d six sanity points gone. You don't get to roll for sanity to see if you can hold on to those sanity points. If you cast a spell, you automatically lose that sanity. Now, I think again, the getting used to the horribleness. I think that still applies. Uh, so after you lose 18 sanity points by casting this spell, maybe you, won't, you don't suffer that anymore. I don't think that's the case with spell casting, to be honest. But yeah, 3d6 sanity is not you know, it's anything to be taken lightly. And sanity does not come back uh, as easily as hit points or ability score damage. So another thing to, uh, to keep in mind. You do regain sanity every time you gain a level. Uh, so whenever you gain a level, like go from first to second or second to third or so on and so forth, uh, yeah, I think you get to roll a d6 and add that to your, your sanity score. And that number can go above your starting sanity, but can never go above 99. 
So yeah, so two Conjuring for Become Spectral Hunter, as well as three Six Sanities. Pretty rough. There was one here that I saw that was even even nastier, so I want to see if I can find that real, uh, real quick here. I wish I should have taken a note of what the name of the spell was. Um, but yeah, it was, here it is. Uh, Eye of Light and Darkness. So this one, uh, it costs you no sanity points, which is cool, but it costs 20 constitution drain. And that's permanent. So if your con uh, is above 20, like let's just to say for some, you somehow you had a 22 con. So you had 18 to start with and you gained enough levels and you put all of your ability score increases into con. You cast this spell once and your 24 becomes a 4. So it's, that's again, pretty, uh, pretty nasty and pretty potent. Uh, but yeah, most, like I said, most uh, spells will have Ability score, damage, or drain, and sanity point costs. And again, the reason for that is simply to prevent people from just being, you know, very cavalier in the way that they cast their spells. There is a definite drawback uh, to, you know, abusing magic in the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game, which makes sense. There should be. You know, that's just something that, you know, sh you know it should go without saying, but I'm glad that they factored it in there. Uh, we also have some creature stats uh, for the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game. Again, this is the D20 system, so it is based off of like the D20 uh, rules for the way that they have their characters or creature stat blocks. You got their hit dice, their initiative, their speed, their different attacks, special qualities, um, saving throws, uh, if they're resistant or immune to certain things. You've got all of that in here. You got the Great Race of Yith, which I. I love the great race of Yeth. Uh, I think they're awesome. The little cone-shaped people. Uh, just they're they're weird, but they're awesome. Serpent people. Uh, the first ever Call of Cthulhu game I ran, which was the seventh edition rule set. Uh, the serpent people were actually the uh, the primary antagonist, and I actually really enjoyed that adventure. I think it was kind of my players really enjoyed. It. I ran it for two different groups, and they both responded pretty well. So. Really happy with that. Uh, and then you've got the Cthulhu Mythos. So to give you sort of a description of some of the different creatures. Um, they're not satted out in this section of the book because I don't think you're really meant to come across them. Uh, then we also have some rules for designing stories and running the, running the game. Uh, the setting information, so the different time periods that you can run Call of Cthulhu in. The Cold War, modern day. There's two adventures included in here as well, which I'm not going to go through too much here, but it is cool that they give you two of them. And then we've got this last section, which is, uh, you know, rules and guidelines for introducing the Call of Cthulhu uh, role-playing game elements into your Dungeons & Dragons game. And I just always remembered this piece of artwork here with Cthulhu. Uh, he's batting away Krusk the Barbarian. Uh, Regdar the fighter is just dead. Tordek, the dwarf fighter, is doing all right, and you've got Miley there uh, casting spells. I was hoping that I thought Lydda was actually in there too, the halfling rogue. I thought she was in this picture as well, but uh, I guess not. I guess I was just remembering that wrong because I kind of thought that she was like crawling up the back of Cthulhu, but uh, yeah, that's just me remembering things incorrectly. So uh, there you go. But yeah, it gives you some guidelines for introducing Call of Cthulhu stuff into your uh, into your game. Uh, it also gives you, like, again, the spells from uh, Call of Cthulhu and sort of how to introduce them into your uh, your D&D campaign um, with, like, their schools of magic and stuff. Uh, the spell descriptions in, uh, in, the, in and of themselves really shouldn't change all that much either. And then we've got the stat blocks for the Great Old Ones and the other Cthulhu Mythos creatures. So here we have Azathoth, which is a challenge rating 50 creature which is absolutely, uh, absolutely no joke. Cthulhu, which is CR 34. The King in Yellow, um, which I actually was using in my last Call of Cthulhu game. I just never got far enough to run it. Uh, you've got Father Dagon and Mother Hydra. I don't hear enough people talk about Mother Hydra. Like, Dagon is a very, like, you know, well-known uh, name from, like, the Cthulhu stories and other, like, real-world mythologies. 
Um, so like it's you know like I see like Dagon was also ported into 3.5 as like an Obrith Lord. Um, but yeah, I don't see enough people really talk about Mother Hydra. I remember in the Call of Cthulhu Dark Corners of the Earth game for the PlayStation, the boss fight with Mother Hydra was essentially where uh, myself, my friend, and a lot of people just gave up on that game. Uh, but yeah, you get the stat blocks there if you wanted to use them in your 3rd edition uh, Call of Cthulhu... Uh, or sorry, your 3rd edition D&D game. Uh, and then you got your character sheet, which again looks very much like the 3rd edition D&D character sheet as well, because it should, because it is based off of that and uses the same rule set. So there you have the Call of Cthulhu D20 system. Again, it's not really a comprehensive look or a deep dive into the rule set, but this is a very interesting combination of things. Ultimately, I would say that the D20 system rules just really don't work well with the Call of Cthulhu, uh, like the, the, the environment or the sort of the, the, the themes of like the way Lovecraft sort of wrote his stories. With this version of the game, the D20 system, your everyday people can still become quite heroic compared to the average citizen with being able to survive things that, you know, someone else might not be able to with the extra hit points or, or you know, the, the extra saving throw bonuses. So, you know, being able to level up is very different for a Call of Cthulhu role-playing game where normally your base stats stay the same and you just get to improve your skills as you progress through the stories. But death is always a very real possibility in the, uh, the Chaosium version. So the having the leveling system, again, it does feel very, very different. It's not quite the peanut butter meets chocolate that I think uh, they were really hoping for. And I don't, I haven't really seen a lot of reviews on the D20 Call of Cthulhu uh, RPG, but a lot of the ones that I remember from back in the day all kind of said that it was a really well-designed rule set and a very interesting rule set, but it just doesn't really feel like a Call of Cthulhu game. It feels like D&D &D with horror elements, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. This was how I was introduced to the Call of Cthulhu RPG. I had already known of Lovecraft and had read a few of his stories by the time that I got into uh, the D20 RPG, but this was the first time I actually got a chance to make a character and play in a Cthulhu Mythos uh, environment. So I'll always have a warm spot uh, for this, but looking back at it, it is a very different kind of game. That said, there is a modern day equivalent to this D20 system. The D20 system uh, Call of Cthulhu game was meant to be uh, a more action-oriented uh, Call of Cthulhu experience. You have your hit dice, you have your base attack, you have all those sort of things that make it so that combat is more likely to not only occur, but to, you know, for the players to actually be able to overcome. And with the Nocturnum campaign, like, I just remember looking through that and realizing, like, there's a ton of combat that in a standard Call of Cthulhu role-playing game would pretty much mean certain death at almost any given term or any given time. So with the D20 system, you are a bit more, uh, like I said, you're, you're more heroic. You are more of a, well, basically a D&D &D character uh, set in, in like, you know, 1920s um, Earth or you know, the year 2000 if you want to involve computers and stuff like that. Um, it's not, like I said, it's not a bad system at all, but um, it's not what you would normally think of when it comes to a Call of Cthulhu RPG. But as I said, there is a modern equivalent to this, and that has to be the Pulp Cthulhu book, uh, which I actually have, and I don't know if I actually did a video on it really or not. I think I made a character for it, but never really went more in depth than that. But Pulp Cthulhu is an action-focused uh, version of the Call of Cthulhu Chaosium RPG, where your characters are meant to be hardier. They're meant to be more capable of not only defending themselves, but even being able to go on the attack and reasonably have a chance of defeating most Mythos creatures. Uh, the, uh, the Pulp Cthulhu also has, I think they're called Talents, but they're essentially feats just sort of uh, redressed under the Chaosium sort of um, you know, presentation. But you actually have, again, a very almost D20 kind of feeling 
uh, you know, equivalent in, in the Pulp Cthulhu. So if you wanted that action-oriented approach, then it is something that is available now. But back then, if you were playing like 6th edition Call of Cthulhu and you wanted something where your characters were more durable, uh, they were more uh, able to sort of, uh, you know, be more aggressive uh, or assertive and being able to, you know, take the fight to the Mythos creatures, the D20 system was the way to go about it. It's an oddity. It is an interesting combination of things. It doesn't quite catch the atmosphere of the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game, especially not as good as the Chaosium uh, versions do. But it's still a very interesting uh, system, and it was a great way to get people that were playing Dungeons & Dragons, or maybe were only familiar with Dungeons & Dragons, to get them into something else by having this D20 system framework, but having a different um, genre and a different approach to the way that you sort of design and run the adventures. And yeah, it was it was cool. Um, again, it wasn't quite chocolate meets peanut butter, uh, but it was you know a very interesting uh, you know kind of uh, combination of things. And it is worth you know kind of considering and checking out nowadays. Again, especially if you have a group that is you know largely or maybe even only familiar with the D20 system kind of role-playing games, but you want to get them into more of a horror thing, this might not be a bad way of going about it. And, uh, you know, if the Call of Cthulhu, if the, you know, the action-focused, you know, uh, hit, well, not hit dice, but just being able to actually, you know, stand up for yourself and have a good chance of winning fights is something that appeals to you, then Pulp Cthulhu for the modern days might be something to look into as well. But really interesting thing. And uh, again, just a very unique uh, kind of mashup of, you know, high fantasy um, or the D&D rule set uh, along with the crippling insanity uh, and horrific creatures of uh, Lovecraft stories. So cool stuff overall. Let me know in the comments below. Did you guys ever play or run Call of Cthulhu using the D20 rule set? Um, you know, or if, if, or you just prefer the current uh, Chaosium version, 7th edition, have you run Pulp Cthulhu and actually use the more action-oriented Chaosium rules? Let me know all that stuff in the comments below. Or did you even know that this existed? Let me know that as well. Anyway, thank you all very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed, and I will see you all next time. Until then, take care.